Hey friends, welcome back to the garden here at Tam Terra. It is the first week of August. I'm going to take you around, show you the growth and progress. We are out here pretty early because we have a lot of chores to do today. So let's get started. We're going to be starting with the beds closest to the house today and I am going to be harvesting as I go because it is that season. <laughs> this is my first day off coming into three days off here and I got a lot to get out of the garden. First on the list this morning is our bush beans. We have a yellow variety of bush beans and they're actually doing really well. I think my only complaint is that because the bean themselves are yellow, the color is closer to the stems, so it's hard for me to tell when a plant has a lot of beans on it from a far distance away. So like looking out of the kitchen window, I can't really see that these guys need to be harvested. And the other day I came out here and was a little shocked at the amount of beans I had to get off the plants. I don't think I'm going to be canning any beans this year. Next year, I really want to make sure I get my hands on a green variety of bush bean. I don't mind the yellow ones for fresh eating. I just don't think that they would look very appetizing if I were to can them. So next year, I'm going to grow this variety as well as getting my hands on some green bush beans. I planted our beans next to the corn that I'll show you progress here in a minute. It's gotten quite huge and it's starting to push off those little spindly tendrils at the top. Um, it's really enjoyed the shade that the corn has provided. Like I've mentioned in a previous, like I've mentioned in previous tours, these three garden beds that are closest to the house, they get full sun and can easily hit up to 40 degrees a day uh, quite frequently. So that's quite hot for a lot of plants to be exposed to for long periods of time, like eight hours. I am also happy with this placement because as you probably know, corn is quite a heavy feeder and beans are nitrogen fixing plants. So they're good buddies to put in garden beds or to plant near each other. And both of them seem to be doing really well this year. We've got a plethora. <laughs> Honestly, it's so much easier from down here. I feel like my only tip for bean harvesting that I have, well, I have two. The first would be get underneath the plant and look up. That way you see a lot more beans without having to come through and pick all your plant up. So if you were ever at my house and you just see me looking up at all of the garden beds, it's because I'm looking for fruit. <laughs> My next tip is to save you some time when you're actually going to cook or process or preserve your beans. I don't really mind because I don't have a lot and I'm not canning them, so it's not much of a chore for me to do it while I'm preparing them to eat. But it saves you a bit of time. Instead of just pulling the bean off of the stem, you can actually just use your nail. If you have nails, I don't. That was actually kind of hard. Uh, <laughs> to leave this little bit here so you don't have to chop it off when you're getting them ready to cook. So now you don't need to trim your bean. It's actually just good to go. So it's less clean up inside, but it's up to you. I don't really have nails, so that's not necessarily faster for me. <laughs> Another thing I've learned about yellow bush beans is that they actually start off green and they become yellow while they ripen. I might have to change my tune and put some of these up for the winter because if they keep producing like this, I'm not going to be able to keep up with them for fresh eating. While I'm down here, I will show you the next round of beets that I planted just at the edge of this bed. They're not as large as I was expecting or as the ones I planted in the other bed at the same time as these. These do not get as much sun as the other bed. I'll show you those beets that I started at the same time here for a bit of comparison. I sowed these beets at the same time in my last garden tour video, as well as these red bull's blood beets. 
And as you can tell, they are taking off in this garden bed compared to the other one. These beets here are tucked in behind the beans and on top of that, behind the corn. So they do not get as much sun whatsoever. Depending on the time that the corn comes to maturity, if these bean plants finish up in time, these beets uh, might still do really well for us once there's some more sun exposure. I had planted them here thinking that there would be too much sun in the middle of August for them and I wanted to keep them out of the heat. But it's a cool little A-B test because these beets in the other bed are fully exposed to the sun and they are doing very well. So. The beds are amended soil-wise the same, so the only real variation I can tell that it is happening would be the sun. So it's good to know that beets grow well in a lot of sun, and I just have to watch most of the heat, the temperature, more so than just simple sun exposure. Now on the other side of my corn bed here, we still have nasturtiums in full-blown glory. They are starting to be a little worse for wear, but the bees are still loving them. We have our Cosmos here as well. They are definitely long and straggly and heading over the bed, but I like the wild look and again, the bees are enjoying it. A little closer look here. We've got our second bout of radishes interplanted with the corn, keeping them out of the sun. So hopefully they don't bolt as bad as the first round that I had did. I had to make a massive batch of radish top pesto because I had no root growth on those and they bolted right away. Look at these little radishes and all of these radish greens. Now, <laughs> yes, I have some bigger ones. There are some successful radish stories among the basket full of failures. However, I also have a recipe for radish green pesto, so it will not go to waste, but this is definitely not the abundant radish harvest I had originally thought I was going to be experiencing this morning. The next exciting development for this bed would be the corn tops. I don't know what they're called, but I am excited. Several of the plants have started to show the little corn top thingies, and I'm so excited. The corn is huge. It's hard to show you how huge because it is in a raised bed, but I'll back up here so you get a bit of a bigger look. Like I said, super tall. Lots of yellowing going on in the lower leaves, but I'm assuming that that is pretty normal. Most of the cornfields around here have something similar happening. And we've got these magical stringy little tops showing up. So hopefully we'll get some good sweet corn this year. Now at the back of the corn bed here, it is looking a little worse for wear. There were three large kale plants here by the straw at the end of this bed that I let go to seed. I had those plants over winter from last year and I didn't have any seeds of those varieties. So I let them go to seed, harvested the seeds, and then they got the biggest infestation of aphids that I have literally ever seen. So I tore them up. The area here is quite shaded. So I'm going to get some new lettuce varieties in the ground this year for a fall harvest. It's given these two kale plants a bit more room to grow. I will say they were quite squished in here prior, as well as the Swiss chard gets a bit more sun and is doing a little bit better now that it has some room to breathe. There is a tiny row here of more kale planted. A few orac plants are planted along on this side, as well as some more Swiss chard. At the front of this bed, I do have some mystery pepper plants growing. The plants themselves don't look to be doing too hot. This one is just starting to flower up here right now. I wasn't expecting to get much off of these whatsoever. They were a gift from a friend from a salsa blend, and I have no idea the variety. I mean, it looks like a jalapeno, but don't they all at this phase? So we shall see. On to the next garden bed, we've got our tomatoes, and this is where I planted a lot of the second round of root crops, as well as our 
king of the north pepper plants. Most of the garden took a serious hit when we had that week, week and a half of 40 to 45 degree weather, but I think I'm going to have the most glorious pepper harvest this year because of that weather. So since you guys were out here last, our tomatoes have really taken off. Like I said, that 45 degree week really threw a kink in the whole grow plan for most of this garden. A lot of this leaf curling and thickening of leaves in these tomato plants started happening during that extreme hot week. But the new growth on all of these tomato plants, I am happy to report, is normal and looking extremely healthy. There is a few different type of viruses or fungus that can cause leaf curling in tomato plants. And for about a two week stint there, I was extremely worried that somehow all of my plants had gotten this virus or this fungus and that our tomato crop was going to be completely lost this year. But monitoring the simple basic needs of the plant, being sun exposure, nutrients, water, we did fertilize the bed with some all organic slow release fertilizer and the weather significantly cooled down. With all of those factors, the plants are looking great. So it's not a fungus, it's just making sure that they have what they need and getting them through that really hot, hot weather spell we had. Taking a closer look here at the tomato plants, we have fruit. So nothing has at all started to ripen, but we've got some good sized tomatoes forming here. This whole row are the early girl indeterminate tomato varieties. Really excited to see how well they're doing for indeterminate plants in our short climate. I'm hoping we can get a lot of fruit to ripen on the vine off of these guys and that indeterminates would be possible in our sort shorter growing season. A few of the celery plants that we put in the ground here have taken off really well. These were just growing on the windowsill in the house, so happy that that's working. And this chamomile plant here has just gone kind of crazy. It's getting to the point where it's just starting to put on some flowers, which is exciting. I'll show you what I mean by some of this leaf curling and thickening. This is a very thick, oh, I broke it. This is a very thick rubbery leaf. It's just hard. I don't know if you can hear that, but super thick, super rubbery compared to the new growth on these plants. I'm so happy to see that it's not some type of virus, but it was just in fact some really harsh growing conditions there for a while. The indeterminants are still putting on a lot of flowers. And they're looking good, guys. This is exciting. The trellis is working great. I do have to find just some ties to tie the plants up because they are starting to get heavy. Now, our indeterminate variety is actually not doing as well as the determinate ones, and I'm not sure if that's because of the placing of them in the garden bed, but this guy here is just completely stunted and he's not going to grow anymore, I don't think. He has no flowers. This is as tall as he is. I think I might have messed up pruning him or he just kind of got pushed out between these two larger plants here. This is the Manitoba. It is a determinate variety, like I said. It's also in like the sunnier part of this bed and it shades out the indeterminates, so I think that's why it's taking a little longer to get going, but its new growth is looking a lot better than the old growth as well. It is putting on flowers, and a few of the other Manitoba in the same bed are putting on tomatoes, so they have lots of flowers coming in, and they are actually starting to set fruit as well. Oh, quite a bit, look at it here. Definitely not as big or as early in setting fruit as the early girl indeterminate variety. So I'm not sure if that's just because it's bred to be an early producer or if it's the difference between determinate and the indeterminate varieties. But safe to report that all of the tomato plants here have gotten over the worst of the weather, are growing quite well, and look like they're going to give us some tomatoes. I also learned a little bit about Tiny Tim tomato plants. Turns out not just the tomatoes themselves are tiny, but the whole plant is actually bred to remain tiny. So I thought I did something horribly wrong and somehow dwarfed all of my Tiny Tim tomato plants because look at the size difference. Tiny Tim tomato plant. Putting on a lot of fruit, by the way. Like, a lot. 
which the fruit is actually quite large compared to this plant. I don't know. I don't know. This is like a little bit of an anomaly to me. I don't understand how this works. But look at how tall this is. It goes up to like the first rung here of our trellis compared to the other <laughs> tomato plants. They're huge. And the tiny Tims all along this row are, as the name implies, tiny. They are setting so much fruit though. Look at all of these. As well as the one all the way over there in the corner you can see as well. At the back of the tomato bed where it is the most shaded. Oh, hello Ripley. Hello Ripley. You wanna show them the tomatoes? At the back of our tomato bed here where it is the most shaded, I have planted another batch of carrots and they all came up. They're doing quite well. Oh, Ripley's gonna help me film a garden video. Should I post? See? <laughs> He has to be right where I am all the time. No personal space. But we do have carrots going in the back of this bed that we're hopefully not going to eat right now, Ripley. They are not ready. They are not ready. But they are looking very, very good. We also managed to save a few random geraniums. They're planted in here as well, putting on flowers and looking super cute. Now I showed you the beets that I planted in the other bed at the same time as these, and these ones have just taken off. I just did two rows of the red bull's blood. Looking super good, super healthy. They're a new variety to me this year. I've not grown them before, so really excited to see those guys. I also have more of the cylindra beets growing in there, also doing really well. And I just kind of wild seeded a bunch of Thai basil in here because my other bed that had few basil varieties definitely isn't doing well. I showed you guys that in a previous garden tour. A little bit embarrassing, but I'm happy to see that I'm going to get some basil off of this garden bed. Now on to the peppers I was talking about. I am extremely surprised that they're doing this well. My mother had told me that our garden season was really short and we start off cold and end really cold so that peppers might not like growing here and they're doing so well. I don't know if it's because of that warning but I did not have high hopes so no matter what were to happen if I even got one pepper I think I'd be this dressed but this plant alone let me see if I can show you one two three four five Ooh, look at the little guy and then i think six down here and it's got more flowers this guy in here oh my goodness oh my goodness i didn't even see all these ones yet <gasps> what one two three four five six seven eight nine nine ten oh my goodness this is the best part of my day <gasps> look how many peppers Oh, growing things is so cool. Oh, there's more in there. Can you see them? I'm very excited. <laughs> I will say I'm really excited about having the nasturtiums here right next to... <laughs> Ripley, leave the bees alone. <laughs> I am very happy with how having the nasturtiums right next to the peppers is going. Not only do the nasturtiums bait away things like aphids and pests that might get to the peppers, but they also draw in so many bees and invite them right in here. And I feel like that's why I've got such good pollination happening and such good pepper production this year is because the bees are just getting right up in the pepper plants because they're drawn in by these bright yellow nasturtiums or orange, I guess. Look how pretty. I'm trying to move fast so this garden tour isn't like three hours long, but there's so much to show you at this time of year. We're on to the squash bed where I've got two varieties of cucumbers, three zucchini plants, a volunteer squash, a bunch of random pepper plants, some calendula and marigolds, cosmos, malabar spinach. There's a lot in this garden bed. That being said, I did start off with Four zucchini plants in here and one of them I think it was just 
sprouted out, it had only ever produced one zucchini and just a bunch of male flowers only. I had tried leaving it alone. I had tried harshly pruning it to get it to produce. I did a few different things. And at the end of the day, I decided to just take it out of the garden bed. I have more than enough zucchini with the three plants that I have in here. I actually have too much zucchini. <laughs> so I decided to take out the fourth zucchini plant and give our cucumbers back here some more breathing room. Same with the pepper plants. It never feels great to kill a plant that is healthy and has grown and you started from seed, but at the same time it was a calculated sacrifice. Starting at the front of the garden bed here, we have calendula. I pretty much always let it go to seed. If you have never saved seeds, I would recommend saving seeds from calendula plants. They are so easy to grow. They have so many medicinal properties. You can use them all over skincare. I don't have any open right now because they are a sunflower or a type of sunflower, so they open during the sun and it's too early. But then after, this will open up. And then this is what it looks like when it's just finished its life cycle and it's starting to produce these crazy looking seeds down here at the bottom. And then this is what it looks like when the seeds are just maturing on the plant. Now, they look pretty gnarly. If you were to just leave this here, these seeds would start to dry up, go brown, and then just drop. That's why calendula is so good at self-seeding. If you leave this here, wait for them to brown up a little bit more, and the texture changes. Like, you can see that this is still malleable. It gets to a point where it's not. At that point, if you save them, and you can plant them again next year wherever you would like. So I do a bit of both. I will take off the plants little flowers that are done so that it keeps producing new heads. I will let some go to seed on the plants because I don't mind when they just volunteer in the garden. I like that. It's cute and wholesome and just part of the natural flow of a garden. So I think I, I leave a lot on the plant to be honest, <laughs> but I do collect some. It was one of the first seeds that I had ever saved off of a plant in my garden. So if you are new to seed saving, I would recommend giving it a shot with calendula. It's really easy to succeed and it's really easy to tell all of the different phases of the flower. Now moving behind all of our calendula, we've got our pepper plants here that are doing, again, ridiculously well. Look at all these peppers. This one's actually so big. Putting on a bunch more. You can see some on the plant back there. This right here is where that other zucchini plant was. And as you can tell, there's really not a lot of room for how big zucchini plants get. So I'm happy I took it out so these peppers have a bit more room to breathe as well as this random volunteer squash plant. It's doing quite well. It's got quite a few flowers attracting lots of bees to the garden. I don't know what squash plant it is. It does not look like a winter squash, a pumpkin, or a spaghetti squash because I have those three planted in various places in the garden. So I'm thinking it might be a birdhouse squash, but it is a pleasant surprise and we will just have to wait and see. Honestly, the zucchini is doing amazing. It always does amazing. It's such a prolific plant. So much fruit. For two people living here, I do not need four zucchini plants. I need maybe two, maybe three. I have already put up so much zucchini and we're just in August. These guys are gonna produce all summer long. They're extremely healthy plants. I am very happy that we've got this much zucchini but it's definitely a good lesson. Next year, I need maybe two plants, not four. So back here, this is the Suyo Long Cucumber. I've got two plants growing up the greenhouse here. It is doing a lot better now that it has some more room at the base with some more airflow. I am surprised at how fast this cucumber plant grows whole cucumbers. Look at him. Such a funky long shape and they are pokey. So last week this plant was about this tall. This week it's about that tall. <laughs> That's a lot of growth.
On this side of the squash bed, we've got the Market More Cucumber growing up on this trellis. It has started to do a lot better. It was looking a little worse for wear about a week and a half ago. I stopped watering the bed as much. We did fertilize and like I said, the weather has significantly cooled down. So all of those factors I think have helped this plant to be doing a lot better. It has so many little guys. Let me see if I can find you one. There you go, look at that little cucumber. Another one coming in there. It's always crazy to me how spiky these things start off as. I would suggest, especially if you're new to gardening like me, to plant different varieties of the same type of plant. Having two different cucumber plants here, I get to do cross comparisons all the time. Like the Suyo Long Cucumber handled the heat a lot better, but the Market More Cucumber is a lot better for making things like pickles. So having one of each, I get to kind of decide what meets my needs better. Now, I feel like the garden bed behind me might look a little worse for wear. The winter butternut squash, I have four of them planted in the bed behind me. They have grown so much foliage. These things have covered our propane tank almost completely and have finally started producing flowers and setting fruit. That being said, a lot of the leaves that are closer to the base of the plant, so actually in the garden bed, were yellowing out. So I pruned them pretty intensely just to open it up quite a bit and to expose those flowers to the bees so I could help ensure that we had good cross-pollination and actually set some fruit on these plants. So I pruned them pretty intensely and this is about a week after that. There is still some yellowing happening, but I'm assuming that that is because I took away a lot of the big covering leaves and exposed some of the younger, softer ones to the sun. They did not have a gentle, slow transition to that. They were fully shaded and then boom, right out in the sunshine. So there is some yellowing, but the plants themselves are very healthy and we got some squashes forming. We obviously have our cosmos, marigolds, we've got a lot of flowers happening and so much plant going on here. There are a few peas that have managed to make it this far, but they are not looking too hot. I feel like they're still probably edible, but you might just not eat the outside. Yeah, look at this. It's so good. I feel like one, it's not a garden tour unless if I eat something, and two, peas are so cute as a food. Our spring harvest of peas was not very good. It got really hot really fast here, so I think I'm going to try to plant some more snap peas for a winter or a fall crop. So I can still get my pea dose. Look how small these ones are. This one you eat the whole thing. I think you like it. Okay. Are you rolling in the pee? <laughs> Are you rolling in the pee? Like I said, these squash plants have almost fully engulfed the propane tank and they have gone into the bush and starting to take over the paths as well. Okay, I like a little bit of a wild aesthetic. And we've got some butternut squash forming. Super excited. Last year I tried to grow butternut squash and the plants all died. I don't remember what happened, but they did not do well. Very excited to see squash forming on these guys. Got another one over there. 
for transparency's sake, I am going to bring you up to the very acidic soil of my not-so-glorious garden bed. Not everything is growing well. This entire, what, I think it's 16 feet long garden bed here? Not happy campers. I'll take you in for a little bit of a closer look. But we have decided that because this bed is underneath a pine tree, the soil is quite acidic, that uh, we are going to be planting our blueberry bushes here next year. We will make some soil amendments, probably do some testing just to make sure that we're not putting in a bunch of perennial shrubs in an area that is not viable whatsoever. I'm hoping that it's just because the soil is rather acidic, because blueberry bushes like acidic soil, it seems like a good fit. So fingers crossed that that will work out, but let's look at what the acidity level of this soil is doing to a bunch of my herbs. So to be honest, the cilantro did pretty well for a while, but now it's just kind of stuck like this. Some of it has gone to seed, I am probably going to just let it seed and see what happens. The rosemary is probably doing the best, but still super tiny. So we will see if it kind of grows at all from this point. This is a butterfly weed bush. Definitely not growing bigger than this guy. I believe this is hyssop and it's doing its best, but Leaf discoloration and a very slow maturation rate, not good soil. Chamomile plant, tiny, not doing well. Bunch of sweet basil, finally stopped getting eaten by pests, but has not grown from this point on at all. Thai basil, I planted this in the ground almost two months ago, and it is smaller than the stuff that you saw on the other bed that I planted maybe two weeks ago. It's also, I think, going to flower right now because it thinks it's dying, because it kind of is. Opal basil, surprisingly well, but again, not a very healthy looking plant. Parsley, again, curly leaf parsley here, not doing too bad. I've seen worse, but it's definitely not thriving. Got a couple sage plants on this side. The only reason these sage plants are this big is because they actually overwintered. They are not happy other than that. <laughs> I do have some catnip here that's actually gone to seed and looks like some damage has occurred, but it's gone to seed pretty quick and barely grew. This is also, I believe, not hyssop, but bee balm? No. I don't know what that one is. The name is escaping me, but it seems to be doing okay. So yes, next year this garden bed will be home to our blueberry bushes. All of the oregano has now gone to seed. The beads have been loving it. I will be thinning this bed out eventually here and giving some of the plants away to my friends with gardens. But yeah, no oregano harvest for us this year because we still have so much from last year. So. We just let it live its life and the bumbles bees and the butterflies have been really enjoying it so we ended up splitting up our comfrey bush this year so this is the growth off of a little chunk of root that we separated it's just here in the forest off the side of a path and it looks to be taken which is very exciting this is the mama comfrey plant it's doing quite well as well. It's just behind our doghouse here and next to our bed that we have our mint in and a bunch of bolted lettuce. Now down to the tiered garden beds where it is sunny and warm. As you can see, we have two different types of sunflowers that are taking off. I've never grown sunflowers. These are from a wild mix variety pack. The are <laughs> There was only two seeds that germinated. These are them. From the looks of it, we're gonna have one that has multiple heads there in the back. It's the taller one. And we're gonna have one up here in the front that produces one big singular head, which for me is like the best of both possible sunflower experiences. I've always liked the ones that have a lot of flowers going on because of course it looks beautiful but then the classic one big sunflower head is a classic so I'm excited to have both I don't know if they're gonna be both I don't know the varieties they're from a mixed pack it's a surprise 
This year's Brussels sprouts are not doing so hot. A few of them were completely eaten by either gophers or rabbits. And the ones that are upright and standing still have some severe cabbage moth damage. Hi, Mom. So this is my mom. Hi, guys. She is the other person who eats all of the food that we grow here. <laughs> They're going on a walk. It's Eden's birthday. She is the Tammy in Tamterra. Bye, Mom. I left my coffee. I had to go back for it. And then I ran into me, Mom. It's cold. That's okay. Our strawberry patch is overgrown with obviously some grass as well as other weeds like thistle. So we have a thistle problem. We've always had a bit of a thistle problem. It's because thistles seem to grow so well on recently disturbed soil and I live in the forest. There is a lot of recently disturbed soil and they spread via the root system. It's not something that you have to wait to flower and then the seeds, no doesn't work like that. It spreads by its roots, so you really have to get in there and get it out. And honestly, you can probably take the same plant back four, five, six times, and you're still getting offshoots from the same root system. It's extremely frustrating when it's rooted into your garden beds, but the plus side is, is that it does keep some of the birds away from your berry patch. My goal was that the pumpkin plants would grow faster than the thistles, shade them out and then they wouldn't be as prolific that didn't happen because obviously weeds always grow faster than plants because that's just the way of the garden isn't it so the pumpkin plants are still doing really well they're growing i think they're going to be fine i did plant them late because i took the time to clear out this garden bed of all the thistles and the weeds to make room for these pumpkin plants so because of that they're in the ground about two and a half weeks after the other pumpkin plant that I'm going to show you. So hopefully we still get some pumpkins off of these plants. They look really healthy. They're growing really fast. I just hope our season is long enough that we have some maturing pumpkins on these vines by the end of it. There are still a fair bit actually of raspberries coming off of the plants, but we have done most of our harvesting. We have frozen a lot of them. Most years I make raspberry jam. I talk about it in my other garden tour. It was the first preserve I had ever made and it kind of made me fall in love with the idea of growing food and turning it into something that you love to eat. Uh, so I've always had a sweet spot in my heart for these raspberry bushes. This year I didn't make raspberry jam. We just froze most of this harvest. I still have a lot of raspberry jam left over from last year's harvest. And I didn't really think about that when I started this garden this year. You get to plan really long term, especially when you're making preserves. Jam keeps very well canned, obviously. So last year I made a bunch of raspberry jam, which means this year I can use all of these raspberries for something else because my harvest and my preservation of last year will extend past one season or one full year. I've not thought about the long-term implications of that so that I can reserve certain harvests of abundant plants like raspberries for different projects in different years and still have all of the things that I like making out of raspberries. It is so bright in this corner of the garden right now. It is getting later on in the morning, so I gotta wrap this up, but I wanna show you all of the spaghetti squash that we have going on. There is about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven spaghetti squashes that I can see. They formed so fast this year. Look how big they are already at the beginning of August. We've got a bunch more flowers. There's about four plants in here. The plants themselves, something I will mention, they didn't get very big this year. The leaves seem quite small. They're producing a lot of flowers and they've trailed a lot on this fence, but they are nowhere near as rich in foliage as our winter squash were, but they have way more fruit. So probably something to do with the nitrogen soil balances and how much greenery they're producing versus how much fruit. Either way, I'm really happy with how they're doing this year. 
I've got this whole raggedy looking potato plant in here right now. I have been harvesting off of it. I've just been digging underneath it and taking away some potatoes as I see fit. Which is really exciting to me because that potato plant was a volunteer. It just came up from last year because I had a potato plant in the same spot. So it feels like free food, food that involved no intention and no planning and I just get to reap the benefits. That's why I enjoy volunteers. Another person who really champions the idea of volunteers, and if you've not heard of her, I don't know where you have been in the gardening YouTube world, but Jess from Roots and Refuge Farms, she talks a lot about how volunteers are like the perfect little garden treat, the little helpers, and they just show up, want to live, and give you food. So, sounds like a great arrangement to me. This root vegetable bed is looking a little worse for wear. Honestly, that 45 degree week stunted these guys and I did not realize at the time how much of a stunt it was going to be. I thought that if it cooled down, they would bounce back fairly fast. But as you saw in the other beds, the beets that I planted just a few weeks ago have already surpassed these guys in foliage production and are starting to bulb out and form a fair size root already. So what I think I'm going to do, I think I'm going to harvest and pull out of the ground all of these beets and I'm going to can them as like small little beets for like charcuterie boards or just like finger picking pickled beets. They're not going to be winter storage beets, they're not going to be these big solid good sources of like a significant meal but they are not going to go to waste and it's going to give me an opportunity to practice canning. <laughs> I guess they're not as small as I thought they were. Cyl cylindra? Cylin cylindral. That's a good size bead, honestly. I mean, it's not massive, but it's not tiny. I am not giving up on my beet growing endeavor. There is the little Ukrainian girl in me who has a dream of making borscht from her own beets and I'm going to make it happen. I'm not giving up. I will grow a successful beet harvest one year. <laughs> Something that is exciting in this bed though has been the carrots. I've been harvesting them and eating them as I see fit this summer. They're doing well. You guys saw that I planted another round of them in the other garden bed. I'm happy with our carrot growth. We also made some fun recipes off of this wonderfully abundant sage plant back here. I took some Asiago cheese, wrapped them up in the sage leaves, and fried them in butter. It was absolutely delicious, and I would highly recommend giving it a shot. I'll insert a picture somewhere here, but if you want to see me cooking with all of the food that I grow, and to hear a little bit more about some of the recipes I might be using to enjoy the harvest, then follow me over on Instagram. It's the same name as my YouTube channel, Life by Melanie. The rutabagas at the back of this garden bed are getting to be softball size. They're pretty huge. We had one the other day mashed up with some Asiago cheese and butter and it was utterly delicious. I'm gonna pull out this rutabaga. The mother of the rutabagas. Maybe. Oh God. Look at it. Ouch. That's why I don't go in the side. There's sticks. Look at that. Beautiful. So, this right here was my bean teepee. And as you can see, all of my beautiful pole beans that had just made it to the top of this extremely tall teepee are dead because we have a gopher problem and those gophers found their way into this garden bed, only ate all of my beans and killed them. 
all, so we'd get no pole bean harvest this year. I will admit we have honestly been so fortunate with the lack of damage that we have received from these gophers. They are all over the place in this area of the garden and that they only got these pole beans is actually impressive. So despite the pole beans being totally eradicated in this garden bed, we do have a lovely, healthy, huge, singular pumpkin plant. So one pumpkin plant has now taken up this whole area and you can see the difference in growth compared to the ones I planted late in the season. So they are like maybe a quarter, a third of the size of this one pumpkin plant and that's having them combined. So we are starting to form, as you can see here, the cutest little pumpkins. I just am in love with the fairy tale pumpkin in general. I think it is one of the prettiest things you can eat in the world. It looks like, you know Cinderella's chariot? It looks like that's the pumpkin. That's how good it looks. It's a fairy tale. Anyway, growing very well. We've got lots of female and male flowers coming to form now. It's been putting off male flowers here for about a week and squash plants do do that. They release the male flowers prior to the female flowers that have the fruit forming here at the bottom. They do that usually about a week, two weeks before they really start putting on the female flowers. I believe it's because they want to start attracting the bees. They want to get all of the pollinators knowing where they are so that when they do put the energy and the effort into producing these female flowers with all of this fruit on it and their seeds and how they are going to survive year after year, right? Their recreation, procreation, <laughs> that the pollinators know where they are so that they're not wasting their energy when they take the time to produce these. So they bring them in so that the pollinators know, hey, this is a good source of food for us. And then once they have the pollinators visiting their neck of the woods, they start putting on these fruits so that they can better guarantee cross-pollination which guarantees fruit, which guarantees seeds, which guarantees a next season for this plant and passing on its genetics, which is basically nature's, you know, thing, living, growing again and again. And we get to come here and reap the benefits of your little, little, little life. Thanks, pumpkin plant. I'll stop. I'll stop baby talking the pumpkin plant. Thank you so much for hanging out in the garden with me today, guys. I am pretty much in a constant state of garden romance this time of year. There is so much beauty to be had, so much food to eat, and with that comes a lot of work. I think half the fun of growing a garden is being able to share not only the food from it with other people, but also the process. I have found a lot of joy in growing this garden this year, and there's more to be had with preserving and eating and basically reaping the benefits of all your hard work. Now is the time, tis the season. So I'm going to finish picking some chamomile before it's 35 degrees and I can't stand to be out here anymore. And I will see you guys all back here with another video very shortly. As always, live long and prosper. Much love, and I'll see you again soon.